Our Gospel reading this week continues with a very well-known parable of Jesus, the one about the Father and his sons. As a disciple of Jesus who goes to church, you might have noticed that you bump into this parable that I'm about to read pretty often. Um, it might be the most familiar of Jesus' parables, or at the very least, it's neck and neck with the Good Samaritan, I think. Um, this week, I heard from, from friend and former member of Peace, Carolyn Gibbons, and she told me that I could drop her name in my sermon today. <laughs> um, she was writing because she gets the midweek email, and she replied after she had watched the video. And first of all, she lamented that we were having so much fun without her. Um, and then she pointedly wrote, The Gospel of Luke and the Prodigal Son, my oh my. You see, because as we studied the prodigal son in our, in our study on Luke's gospel last fall, uh, Carolyn, as she is known to do, she just laid all of her cards on the table <laughs> before that class, and she said something along the lines of, I do not like this parable, it just really ticks me off. And I sat with someone else this week who brought up this parable. We were talking about scripture in general. And she said, well, you know the one that makes me really mad? <laughs> the prodigal son. That one just ticks me off. This beloved parable, this lovely story told by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ inspires such anger? Yes, sometimes. <laughs> I think that... A few things are true here. First of all, if you feel that way about the prodigal son parable or any parable or any passage of scripture, you are in good company. Uh, second, God, I believe this, God is big enough to handle your honest assessment of this situation, and hopefully your pastor always is too. Um, and third, I think that this anger is actually a sign of one's faithfulness to carefully reading the scripture and considering it against what is known to be true about relationships and how life works and being willing to wrestle with what this parable means for how we are called to live and be in a relationship with other people. I really do believe that that's what scripture invites us to do, not just smile and say, oh, it's all true and good and easy. But to read it, examine it, discuss it, chew on it, struggle with it, get mad about some of it, make peace with some of it. Read it again and see something you never saw in there before and start that process all over again. Read, examine, discuss, chew, struggle, get mad, make peace. But right now, in this moment, I want to invite you to listen to this parable. And for you, it may mean setting aside some strong feelings that you have about it already. I want you to try very hard today to just hear it. As I read it out loud, listen to hear something in it that perhaps you forgot was there, or something that you haven't noticed before. I invite you now to hear the parable of the prodigal family. Listen now for the word of God. Then Jesus, still speaking to the scribes and Pharisees, said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to, the citizen, to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. 
Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. When he came, and when he came and approached the house, he heard the music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command, yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Now in your bulletin, you have an insert to today's sermon outline. And it also, instead of that long scripture passage, it was kind of a, a too long of a scripture passage to fit um, in the bulletin today. It also has a definition for the word prodigal. Now, I looked at that definition for myself this week because it occurred to me that I was not entirely clear what it was that we were saying when we said prodigal son. The word prodigal is a descriptor that is specifically and only typically given to the son. But after I read the definitions, I decided that this adjective in particular can apply very well to the whole family that is represented here. Prodigal. Spending money or resources freely and recklessly, wastefully extravagant. Okay, so that's why we call the younger brother the prodigal son. But also, prodigal, having or giving something on a lavish scale. I want to spend a couple of moments considering what each member of our family is giving or spending in lavish amounts, because I think that the adjective prodigal actually applies to each of them. So the first point on your outline is this. The prodigal younger son trades his father's goodness and love for resources that will not endure. Trades his father's goodness and love for resources that will not endure. So let's read the cultural context here. The first thing to note is something that's still very true today. One does not typically receive inheritance while the bestower of said inheritance is still living. By definition, inheritance is wealth or property left to loved ones after the original owner of that wealth and property is deceased. Asking your parents for your inheritance now while they are still living is poor form, to say the least. You might as well be dead, is what the younger son is saying to his father. In this particular world, the wealth that we're talking about is not cash and stocks and bonds, right? But it's land and livestock. And in the Jewish faith, this part of the story is particularly problematic because of what land means. It's a gift from God to the Jewish people kept in the Jewish family. Um, to accomplish leaving with cash, we have to assume that he would have sold the property and the livestock that's implied in the story that had been bequeathed to him while his father is still living. Now, it's a parable, so that's accomplished pretty quickly um, with the land being sold and the younger son setting off with his money. Now, Jesus says that the younger son takes his money and squanders it. He spends all his money. And then I want you to hear something. Did you hear it? There's a famine, and he begins to be in need. 
Mark Allen Powell wrote a book called Bridging the Gap Between Pulpit and Pew. And I read that book this week, and it's interesting what he discovers about this parable of the prodigal son. He set up a study of sorts. He went to a variety of cultural contexts, and he had people read the parable and then retell it to him. And he discovered this. Most Western Hemisphere readers have no recollection of a famine in this passage. It's a very small, negligible amount of people who mention it in the retelling when he's doing this exercise in the United States or Western Europe. When he asks the question, why is the younger son in trouble? The response in those settings are, the responses are all about how the younger son wasted all his money, how he didn't spend his resources wisely. Now on the African continent, he got a completely different response. Why was the younger son in trouble? Because no one gave him anything to eat. It says that in the scripture. He, he was in need and no one gave him anything to eat. In that culture, hospitality and receiving the sojourner among you would be a virtue. And if the person in his new country were allowing this younger son to go hungry, then it's them that bear part of the blame here as well. Why is the younger son in trouble? Because no one gave him anything. Interesting, right? Before I read this book, I never actually thought about the responsibility of the younger son's employer um, or the other people who were in the village where he was residing. Now, when Reverend Powell went to Eastern Europe, specifically to Russia, he did the same exercise and he asked the same question. And the responses overwhelmingly included the famine and also that the younger son had left his father's house. Why was the son in trouble? Because he left his family home and he tried to exist without their support. Now, it's a parable. It's a story told by Jesus. It's possible to get too far in the weeds with this one. Um, but I think what happens here is that the younger son isn't just getting his inheritance many years too soon. But in doing so, he's trading in his father's goodness and love. His father's protection and support and a place in his father's home. He's trading those things for things that will not endure. Money spends and he spent it, and now he's left with no one and nothing. Thanks be to God, he comes to himself. In the midst of the famine that leaves him without any resources and in the pig pen, he gets enough perspective to see things more clearly and he realizes what he has done. This is his rock bottom. Remember another cultural point, um, pigs are unclean animals to our Jewish brothers and sisters. To do a job that included tending to swine was low enough, but now that he's in the pig pen wishing that he could share their food, um, that's downright degrading. He's lower than low. So he goes home. And we'll get to the prodigal father in a moment, but you know how it goes. He was greeted while still on the road. He gives his rehearsed script, I've sinned against you and before heaven. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Allow me to live as one of your servants. His father receives him and throws a party. And then we hear from the second son. And let's visit with him for a second. Point number two. Point number two. The prodigal older son trades his father's goodness and love for anger and self-righteous entitlement. The prodigal older son trades his father's goodness and love for anger and self-righteous entitlement. So I think the reason that Jesus tells the story this way, nestled here after he's already told the parable of the lost coin and the parable of the lost sheep, is because he knows that he is speaking to the older brothers. He's speaking to the Pharisees and the scribes, remember. He's talking to people who believe that they have done everything necessary, that they have kept the law, that they have walked the line, that they deserve their reward. But they have missed one thing. And it's a big thing. They've missed the goodness and love of God that is not dependent on their keeping of the law. The people Jesus is speaking to when he tells these parables believe and behave as though they are self-sufficient. They don't need God's love and goodness because they are good enough on their own. How much is the old 
older son like the younger son after all. The older son has traded in, knowing the true lavish depth of his father's love and goodness and lived as though he doesn't need them. Yes, he's been dutiful and righteous and did not demand his inheritance early. He has those things in his favor, but he's also believed that he has earned his father's love in doing these things. He believes that it's his because he deserves it. And so instead of celebratory, instead of grateful, instead of understanding what a gift his father's love is, he's angry instead. He's angry because it's not fair. He deserves the things his younger brother is receiving. He deserves the goodness and love his younger brother is being shown. As it turns out, the father does not have a limited or stingy amount of goodness and love. He's a bit of a prodigal, too. Point number three. The prodigal father offers goodness and love in lavish amounts beyond reason. The prodigal father offers goodness and love in lavish amounts beyond reason. The younger son is making his journey home, and something remarkable happens. The father sees him while he's still on the road. How did he see him? Was he watching for his son to come home? Had someone stopped by the house and mentioned that they saw him headed in that direction? I kind of feel like it probably took him a little bit of a while to get there as he rehearsed his speech and kind of timidly approached, I would guess. What is most remarkable is the father's reception of his son. That the son, the son that had shamed him, the son he should have disowned, not one person in the place where the story was told would have expected the father to run and greet the son that had abandoned him and taken a portion of his wealth with him. Even an obedient son, a dutiful son, did not receive the sort of greeting that included running and hugging and kissing like that which is offered by the father here. In the feast, not only is the father going to rejoice that his son is home, but he's going to do it very publicly. He's going to make a big to-do about it. Now this story doesn't make sense. If we believe that a father has a finite amount of love and goodness to offer his children, it does not make sense if we believe that a father's love is earned and doled out according to how children behave or treat the father. The story doesn't make sense if we want to believe in karma or the teachings of the prosperity gospel or that good actions lead to rewards and bad actions lead to retribution. Now listen. Some of us have problematic family relationships, and that makes the story harder to hear and believe. It's true, as children and as parents, we have a hard time living on the gracious side of the story sometimes. It is, after all, a parable. But let's suspend our expectations of family relationships and look at what this parable means for the children of, and citizens of God's kingdom. Now, as disciples, this story is problematic if we relate more to the older son than the younger son, maybe. If we believe that our dutiful observations of Christ's teaching earns us a better grace. If we believe that our standing before God is dependent on the amount of good that we can accomplish more than it depends on God's grace and love. Or if we believe that God would run to greet us, but not someone else. You might have noticed that the story does not end with, and they all lived happily ever after. <laughs> it just kind of ends without any sort of resolution. Did the younger son stay with the family? Was his status restored and they just carried on? Did he live as one who was the recipient of a lavish gift of love and goodness and grace? Or did he forget about that a little bit and eventually return to some of his old ways? Can we relate to that? I can. What about the older son? Did he have a moment where he came to himself as well? Did he realize the mistakes he had been making and cheapening the value and the reach of his father's love and kindness? 
Can we relate to that? I can. What about the father? Did he ever reach the end of his rope with his two prodigal sons? Did he ever give out the last bits of his love and goodness and just disown them both? If he had, could we blame them? I couldn't. But I have hope that that's not possible. And that the prodigal father continues to welcome his children and love them beyond reason. For the rest of their days. Pray with me. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. I was blind, but now I see. God, open our eyes and help us to know the lavish reach and goodness of your love. When we wander like the younger son, speak truth to our hearts and call us home. When we put our hope in our own righteousness like the older son, speak truth to our hearts and call us home. Thank you for your love that is not stingy, that is beyond reason, extravagant, 